uh, looking at leadership at a more holistic model. As, as I was mentioning the other day, it's, it has become my favorite example now. Uh, you know, MIT, uh, up until recently, was a school of engineers. I mean, they took pride in producing engineers, uh, world-class engineers. Some of them went on to become business leaders. However, there were individuals, such as Benjamin Netanyahu, an MIT alum, an MIT graduate, went on to become prime minister of Israel. What kind of training did he have at MIT as an engineer to run a country, to become head of a state? You see? Did he ever, during his time at MIT, share the meal with the Muslim community, with the Muslim students? Did he spend time learning about the Muslim world? Okay. These are some of the deeper questions. You never know which university, which college is going to give rise to the next global leader. You see? So it's not merely sufficient to educate them, to train them only in specialized fields for which they have come from. That university, colleges, institutions of higher education ought to become the platform where at least these insights are given to every individual. Some tools on human reflection, some tools on how to become a good leader, whether you don't become a prime minister or president of a country, but becoming a leader in your own rights. These are the platforms where it needs to take place. So with those intentions, uh, we have begun uh, this, this project. And I do believe it will have a global outreach. And you will hear more about it in time to come. So raise your hand if you'd like to ask Tenzin a question. I know some of you may be disappointed because I don't refer to some of the current uh, ethical dilemmas, but you're more than, wel more than welcome to ask questions, and I will simply opine on it. <laughs> <laughs> Tenzin La, you have said things that, uh, about interaction and uh, individuals sort of isolated, alienated from others. How would you apply your um, training, teaching philosophy to the strength of community? Uh, I've been reading a lot about how community itself is sort of degrading, deteriorating, that glue that keeps people feeling like they're part of a, a town, a community is, is, is diminished. So yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, again, my, my, my view of a community is that a community is not a group of individuals that agree upon everything. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you're looking for a group of individuals who are in agreement, it, it gives rise to a cult. It doesn't give rise to a healthy community. So what keeps a community glued together, is, I think, I believe, is intentions. You, see? you take it Vail Symposium. It's a community. What's the intention? To learn. You see? So having some grand view, you see? having some intention where people set aside their differences, you see? those differences are important. But willing to set aside those differences when they come together and they work upon similar intentions. So that's one important ingredient in a community. And the other kind of ingredient in a community is where individuals begin to realize that by interacting in a community, they themselves are being enriched. Yeah. That it's not merely about what you're giving to the community. Of course, that is important. But that sense of giving becomes much more sustainable when you realize that you are actually the most important beneficiary of all the interactions that happens, that occurs in a community. So those are, I think, some of the important uh, aspects of, of communal life. The religious community operates under, under some similar principles, but more rigorous. <laughs> How uh, do we devise a program for learning these things when the physical and e economic communities we belong to are so large and so diverse? that we do not agree among ourselves what is good to study. I think, uh, you see, as, as I said, that the first problem that I foresee is trying to look at things black and white. Uh, as I said, that engagement and interaction is very important, regardless of whether we come to an agreement or not. See, debate is, an, is a healthy example of it. See, debate. You see, the outcome of it is not always a function of whether we agree on certain things or not. You see. 
but it has to do with the process of interaction. Right? And the more we allow ourselves to interact, to engage with the larger world, we begin to see uh, certain scenarios, certain methods of study that we believe will be more viable for a given community. Okay? So it's not whether we ultimately agree on things. But it's more important to focus on the process that brings us closer as well. That, I think, takes us back to those positive role models that we don't have that might give us some reason for wanting to do that. True, true. Uh, uh, my my, my uh, uh, sort of, uh, you see, and this takes me back to, of course, my religious view, which is, uh, which claims that every individual is born to become a Buddha, that every individual is born to be enlightened. So as far as I am concerned, each one of you has the potential to be a role model. Whether you exercise that potential for the love of future generation or for yourself uh, is up to you, of course. Um, you just spent some time with the Dalai Lama, I believe, right? And I was wondering if he has been struggling with uh, maintaining his compassion when it comes to the uh, Chinese government <coughs> lately or recently. It seemed like maybe that's the case. Well, I, I think uh, you know, he does an excellent task in maintaining his compassion uh, towards the Chinese. And, uh, 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 and I, I believe he's quite sincere uh, when he says that uh, he has nothing against the Chinese, he has something against the Chinese policy. Okay. And that is, again, one of the key ingredients in ethical learning that, you know, as Gandhi used to say, uh, it's very important to separate an individual from what he or she does or believes in. Because what he, she, what he or she does or believes in can change. As long as you believe in the individual. So I think the Dalai Lama, as most of you know, has been patient for the past 49 or 50 years. And I, I believe he'll continue to be patient. I just, you know, we'll see what, what China has to bring. I agree with your tenet that we can all come forward and do this for ourselves, but the, the human flaws that you mentioned seem to work steadfastly against this uh, desire, even if you want it to, you know, you can go out and say or do something that, you know, it's just that human flaw seems to be working against us. Well, you know, the, the thing is human flaws work against us because we are not willing to work against that. Uh, uh, in the sense that you see, when you look at human flaws, you see, mo most of these flaws, when you, when you study them objectively, are simply habitual patterns. See, these are habitual tendencies. And we become cozy with our habits. You know, one of the biggest difficulty uh, in changing our own behavior is that we are comfortable with our habits. We don't want to change those habits. So that takes a certain kind of effort. But I do believe that most of these flaws can be transformed. And there are plenty of examples of that, and there are plenty of training mechanisms. So that's why I said that you see, virtue or ethics is not something that you're born with or that you, you know, have a spark and, and you get it, or you know, some divine revelation happens and you get it. No, it is something that you train in. It is something that you cultivate. You see? And that requires some level of effort, but also a level of passion. Uh, if you can be as passionate about not being angry and not being jealous as passionate, misguided passion when, when you do get angry, I think the flaws will decline. The flaws will uh, deteriorate. 